As we know, God must have a godly government eventually. I'm sure we see the news, we see man's government is simply, it simply doesn't work because of man. And so God has to be careful about who he chooses to be in, in leadership in his government. And as we know, God doesn't make any mistakes and he will bring that about. Let me read Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Uh, I'll start with uh, chapter, uh, verse 21. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave to them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. I think we all know the story of Saul. And... Uh, you know, God didn't even want Israel, the, uh, tribe, the uh, Israelites to have a king, but uh, he decided, okay, if you want a king, you're going to have a king. And in chapter, in verse uh, 22, it says, And when he, God, removed Saul, he raised up in, to them David to be their king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill my will. So we know David was a man after God's own heart. God knew that. God saw that. Did he have God's heart? You know, of course not. No, no one has the heart of God. But he was a man after God's heart, as every Christian should be. So I want to talk, my SVS is becoming a person after God's own heart. All Christians should be after the heart of God. So how did David go, go after it? Let me turn to Psalms chapter 119 in verse 97. 119 in verse 97. And it says, David talking, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. So David knew that the only way that he could put on, that he could develop the heart of God was through meditating on his law. You know, God is a being of law, law and order which seems to be a little bit uh, out of place in this, in this day and age. So David knew that he had to meditate on the law of God. And you know, it's been said that one of the hardest things for human beings to do is to think. I don't know if that's harder than the idea of admitting you're wrong. You know, both of those are pretty hard for human beings, but clearly the idea, the uh, ability to think, really think, is not all that common, even though our brains are continually going and their ideas and thoughts are bouncing around in our head. The idea of actually thinking is, is somewhat rare and and I would say it's probably rare for all human beings from time to time. But God wants us to learn how to think, how to meditate on his laws, on his principles, on his way of life. God wants us to think about it, how we can apply it. The idea that, uh, you know, we don't have to think that we were just told what to do is, is not God's way. He wants us to learn how to think. He wants us to learn how to look at a scripture that tells us either what, not, what to do or what not to do. And he wants us to think about it. Well, how can I apply that as to what I should do and what I shouldn't do? We really need to learn how to think. 
And that's what meditation is. It's focused thinking. Let me read John chapter 14 in verse 15. John 14, verse 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Pretty, pretty, pretty direct. God knows that if we love him, if we really love him, we're going to keep his commandments. Now, are we going to do it perfectly? No. We can't do it perfectly, but we, we should be growing in that. Growing in understanding the love of God. And love and law go cannot be separated. A lot of people think that, that in this day and age that he can. You know, they use the word love in, in such a silly way, really. But godly love is based on God's law and his commandments, his principles. And in the Bible, often God word does not elaborate on principles, on law, on uh, his way of life. He doesn't, he doesn't usually elaborate too much. He expects Christians to think about, well, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by, by that? And so that's what meditation, where, that's where meditation comes in. How we can apply the scripture, the principle, the commandment, how can we apply that in everyday life? And it's so important to realize, and I know we all realize it, life is lived in details. You know, general principle, general generalities, there's nothing wrong with them necessarily, but we have to get into the details of life and how we can apply God's law in the many, many, many details. There are hundreds, thousands of uh, scriptures, actually, that tell us what to do, what not to do. The idea of a uh, sin of commission, a sin of omission. We usually don't talk too much about the sin of omission, but the, uh, both, both are valid. The sin of commission is committing a sin. If we omit uh, obeying a law, a principle, a command, that's a sin of omission. And we have to think about both, both areas. And the only way we can really get in the habit of doing that, from what I can understand anyway, the only way we can really do that is we have to think about the, 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 the principle. I'll get into a little more specific a little bit later, but we have to think about the, the law, the commandment, and then we have to think, well, how, can, how does that apply to my life in everyday life in practical, in specific, detailed ways? And if we don't have that register in our thinking, then there's a good chance we're not going to obey it. We have to make it register in our thinking, in our way of living, in our habits. And habits are so important. Habits are so, in every aspect of life, habits are very, very important. You know, from the time you get up in the morning, every little detail of life, we, there should come a time when we think about every little detail. We don't have to think about every detail every day, but over a period of a year, you know, how can I get up more wisely in the morning? What can I do for the first half hour of my morning? What can I do during the next couple of hours? Every little detail matters to God, and God sees our heart. You know, most people... I think most people actually, you know, we, we, we all have a tendency to think that we have a good heart. Well, we know what the Bible says about the heart. You know, it's enmity toward God. I've, I've actually had some people tell me over the years, 
that once they received God's Spirit, they didn't have any carnal nature. That, that carnality was gone. <laughs> and I, I, I'm thinking, no. Our carnality is always there. The carnal mind is deceitful and it's enmity. It does not like God's way of life. That's what the Bible says. And we have to realize that that carnality is always going to be there. It's a struggle. And then we have, you know, I'm reading a book, or I've read a book recently about, it's called The Unseen Realm. And I think most of us realize this world is not only run, or God, Satan is not only the god of this world, but there are spirit beings. Actually, the Bible, and to a certain extent, calls them little gods. You know, you know, words are just words. They're not gods, but they're they are spirit beings that actually oversee and run every little city, every little country in this world, and they are and the people are influenced by these people, by the by these these angels. And so we have not only our human nature, our own carnal nature to struggle with, we have these spirit beings that in most cases are influencing us to disobey God. And we, we need to realize that. It happens more often than we realize how a spirit being can influence us to think in a wrong way. Obviously, we know Satan does, but there are other demons, I'll call them demons, that do influence the cities and the countries of this world in a way that we, for the most part, people don't comprehend. You know, we need to think about why this world has been the way it has been for the past 6,000 years. And it's because not only our human nature, which we have to struggle with and overcome, but also these spirit beings. They are influencing government. They are, they are the principalities. They are the powers of the cities and the towns and the countries of this world that we need to really think about. And every, every thought uh, has got to be careful. We've got to be careful about that. So we have to really try in every aspect of our life, even the littlest thing in the world we have to think about sometimes, well, can I do this better? Can I, can I really do this in, in a more godly way? I don't care what it is, you know, whether it's brushing your teeth. Can you do it in a little better way? Maybe uh, the, uh, uh, your morning uh, routine should be changed a little bit to make it more efficient. Every little detail in our life, God wants us to think about and to use wisdom and to, to really try to be more and more like God. We're all, we're all going to sin until we're changed. And we don't even know what's going to happen when we're changed. I don't know if you've thought about it. I've thought about it from time to time, the idea. What's going to happen when we're changed? You know, we're going to be spirit. We're going to have a, a different kind of a mind. But it's going to be our character. God's not going to magically change our character just because we've been changed. And I'm talking about the first fruits here. Uh, God has to trust his, the leaders of his government. He has to trust them. And so honesty and humility and growing and developing and putting on more of God's mind and character, behavior, God sees that. He sees it all. And even if he doesn't see it all, he finds out all that he needs to find out. We don't know how God does a lot of things. You know, we just don't. We're very limited in what we know about God and, and, and spirit. But he's told us more than enough in his word what's going to happen, what he expects, especially from the first fruits. He has to be absolutely positive that he can trust his leaders. And so, uh, with God's Spirit, you know, we, I think we all realize that uh, God gives His Spirit to those that obey Him. 
Again, we won't do it perfectly, but we have to be have the attitude and the mind to really try to obey him. And as we do that, and not only uh, the insights that the God's Spirit gives us, we have to obey that insight. And otherwise, God's going to say, well, what, what happened there? I gave you an insight and you didn't obey it. So it's a lifelong process of obedience and growing and putting on more and more of God's Spirit. So just a couple of uh, specifics that I think that to me are important in meditation. How, how should we meditate on God's way of life? God's way of life, his principles, his laws, his commandments. You know, sometimes we'll read even a ten, one of the Ten Commandments. What does that mean? How does that apply to my life? You know, we need to think about those things and so we can apply it in a deeper way, in a, in a way that Christ would do it. You know, uh, and so meditation is extremely important in obeying God. You know, getting on the Internet, being careful, but getting on the Internet and actually and, and reading good books stimulates your mind to think about the, let's say, the topic or the principle that you're that you're studying or you're thinking about. You know, nat naturally, we have to have something to stimulate us to think about that. You know, as a general rule, if we read a, a scripture, uh, if we don't read up on it and do a little study, maybe, maybe the study of what certain words mean, uh, then our Generally speaking, the, the mind is not going to go deeper in understanding that principle, that law, that commandment. And so we need to, to do that. And uh, I'm going to say this, and then I'll just make, make a, several comments about specific things. You know, it's clear in the Bible that God, you know, he, he made Saul a king. It says in the Bible, Saul was humble at first. And then I guess he was a people pleaser, and uh, you know he he didn't he didn't uh, go in the direction God maybe expected him to go. I don't know. And so he made David king, and David was a man after God's own heart. He, David was a man of God's own heart, uh, probably from the very beginning. But once people get a position. Once they get a title, once they get a little authority, once, you know where I'm going. And it happened to David, it happened to Moses, it happened to Abraham. I'll just pick on David because, you know, I, I think David was a, a very righteous man. You know, David was the, uh, the king. And here he goes out and commits adultery, commits murder. David didn't know better. You know, there are some egos that are real big and some that are not. We all have an, an ego that's, that's carnal. But David learned from that. David was a good repenter. He repented of his carnality. Did he, did he uh, reach the... Uh, you know, the, the, the perfection, no, no human being does. Only Christ was perfect in that sense. But he learned. He realized he was wrong. Towards the end of his life, he even called himself a worm. And in one sense, that's what human beings are compared to God. You know, God, God is so much greater than we are, we can't even imagine. But uh, sometimes we let our ego get in the way. We think we're somebody. And we are somebody. And God knows what we are. But we can't allow our egos to get in the way of humility and honesty. You know, that always is the wrong way to go. So I'll just list five or six things, you know. 
Bev and I have made a big list of, uh, I don't know how many, over 100 different little things you can do. You know, one of the most important things is be ready to learn. Be ready to learn. Be teachable. You know, realize that we're wrong a lot. We're wrong more than we like to admit. You know, the Bible talks about esteeming others better than yourself. How is that? How does anybody do that? Uh, you know, never really done a study on it, but esteeming others better than yourself. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, God does, and Christ did, but uh, it's, it's a tough one. Really listen to people. Really listen to people. That's a hard one for all of us because we, we, uh, we get, again, we have that ego. You know, pick up someone else's trash. Thank a policeman. Thank a fireman. Being a good worker, go above and beyond. We all fall short, but as long as we're growing, as long as we have a desire to put on the heart of God, God is pleased. And that's what he's looking for. He, he's looking for us to really grow and become like him, become like Christ, to reach eventually the maturity of Christ. And the first fruits are going to be co-heirs with Christ. You know, we can't even imagine what that means. So many things in the Bible, we really don't understand what they mean. But think about them. It makes it more real. And, and you know... I'll finish by saying it. You know, God is God is going to help everyone. You know, sometimes I think we have this idea that we're um, that we're special in God's church. You know, I, I kid kid Bev on the freeway. Well, there goes another special one that's going to crowd in, and you know, where they should have been in the other lane. You know, human beings tend to think they're special. Now, in one sense, everybody's special, but I, I think you know what I mean. In, in another sense, none of us are special. We're all equal. We're all equal under the law of God, under the eyes of God. God is not a, a, a respecter of persons at all. God does not have a respect of persons. He is fair, he is just, and he will make sure that eventually his world, his universe, will be the way he wants it to be. And so we have a great part in that. We have a great opportunity. And so we need to be focused, realizing, if we really look at what's, <clears throat> what's happening out in the world, we have to think there's something very different going on. And so, Whatever motivates you, whatever motivates you to become more like God, pursue that motive, that, per, that way of motivation. We do, do not live in normal times anymore. It won't go back to normal times. Whatever motivates you, then allow that motivation to increase your desire for God's heart.